So, I'm Sam. Nice to be here. And uh, I know that every single one of you is here because he wants to be here, because there's no sessions anymore, except if you're here for the drinks. Then I'm just between you and drinks. <laughs> uh, or maybe your manager is here and you have to be here, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Um, I'm Sam. I'm from Belgium, CTO at uh, Coldit. Um, I'm six years BizTalk VTSP, that's Virtual Technology Specialist, long name in Microsoft. Um, to say that I'm uh, working a lot with the local teams for Microsoft. And I'm also since uh, January um, integration MVP, so happy to be here um, with the other guys. Um, I work for Coldit, so we are in Belgium um, focused on integration um, only on the Microsoft stack. Um, what I'll be talking about is mostly um, workflow. Workflow, um, and it's mostly a prediction of what I feel might be coming with the Windows workflow uh, in Azure. So we know that in November in Redmond on the BizTalk Summit, it was announced that there will be um, you know, a workflow in the cloud coming with the uh, BizTalk services um, thing. And it started to make me think, and I did some basic validation. Um, this will be mostly focusing on concepts, not on the deep technical stuff, because that will change anyway. But the concepts that we see in Workflow Manager today that will probably be a lot of similar context, uh, concepts that we will see in the next um, releases of Workflow Manager. So I'll be talking a little bit on the architecture, uh, multi-tenancy and things like that. Um, I also will talk about state machines and with that I have a nice demo and normally you should also be able to win a prize if Saravana has something left. Um, <laughs> who knows? And of course I have the conclusions. So first of all I'd like to start with a bit of history on the workflow and Look at that, we have Oslo on the page. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have Workflow. I'm, I'm working with, on BizTalk since 2000, so pretty long time. Um, and we actually already had orchestrations like in the Visual Designer in, in 2000, but it's only since 2004 that we actually have real Workflow um, with Xlang. Um, then, of course, we had the long period with Oslo. So Oslo was a nice vision, but it um, actually stopped. But they had the modeling and they wanted to have the model should be the runtime. So that was a nice um, exercise, but then the Azure thing came, so that's also the only technology that has an end date there, 2010. Um, and then of course Dublin came out of that. So Dublin, or AppFabric, for hosting. And there we have WCF workflow services. So that's um, technologies that you have today. And more recently we had um, Workflow Manager coming out. And Workflow Manager came out at the same time as uh, SharePoint 2013 on server. So that also will answer the question that I'll be asking uh, later on, but I'll give it away now. SharePoint is the biggest customer of Workflow Manager. So SharePoint and Service Bus for Windows Server were the two underlying technologies together with SQL that were you know, used for uh, SharePoint workflows. And <laughs> it has always been called Azure Workflow. So that's why I believe we will see things um, coming back. Who has been working with workflow in general? Okay, not that much. So, very high level concept uh, overview. So we have the art, and I didn't um, invent that myself. This is um, Dave Cliff who talked about that, but the art is typically activities. So a workflow consists of activities, you drag and drop <coughs> activities. Um, then you have the runtime, so you can build your own runtime. But of course, most of the time you will use the .NET runtime that you have with you. And there's some tooling. Mostly it's Visual Studio, but you can also re-host the designer and actually provide to your end users a set of activities that they could use and they could build their own workflows. And that's probably something that SharePoint is doing with the SharePoint designer. Very quickly on what has been added um, with 4.5. So a lot of authoring improvements. And yes, we have C Sharp. So we didn't have C Sharp before. It had to be in VB.net. Um, imagine that. Um, so now we have C Sharp. Nice feature. Uh, and we also have the state machine. So state machine is pretty interesting concept where you don't have a sequential only flow. You can really have states from one to the other. So very interesting concept. Um, and we had contract first. So in the past we had to go you know, with classes and so on and that generated the contract. That has been improved and has been changed. Also the versioning. So a typical problem that we had by running multiple versions side by side and having existing Run, long running workflows updated to a new one. And then of course some performance um, enhancements and so on. So 
if I would have had more time, I would have uh, given a demo on where we still use a fabric today at some customers. And that's, for example, with SAP. So with SAP, we have two ways of approaching that. We have the creation of a purchase order, and that's something that you do, you know, you don't want to lose that. A new order that comes in, that has to be persisted. If something fails, you want to retry. So that makes you think about this talk, right? But then we had the customer, and they had a lot of um, sales guys, and even an application that was pretty chatty, and they wanted to get order statuses. So on the e-commerce website, on their mobile devices, and so on. And of course, we could expose that BAPI or um, that RFC on SAP. We could expose that over Bistalk. And we probably had to scale Bistalk a little bit, but they already had 18 Bistalk groups. So we thought that was enough. So what we said, OK, let's do that in a workflow service. So the good, nice thing is you have App Fabric Connect with Bistalk. And there you can use the mapper of Bistalk. And you can use the adapters like SAP. You can use it in App Fabric workflows. So we just exposed a, wor a workflow service to do the get. If a get fails, who, who cares? You just retry or you call uh, Tord, uh, tort, of course. Um, and you just say, OK, we will retry. So there we don't have to have the persistence. And in front, we use something like Sentinet. You might know that, but that's just to virtualize so that the end user doesn't know that we have a problem internally to run some things on Bistalk and some things on AppFabric. So that's a concept where we still use AppFabric workflows today. That might change uh, in the future, of course, with Workflow Manager. So with Workflow Manager, there's three design goals. And th these make you immediately think about cloud. So it has to be multi-tenant. And that's what we see with cloud. Um, with Service Bus, I run all my services, my messages on the same servers as um, my competitors, probably. Um, it has to be high density. So it's not that I will have one machine. No, in SharePoint, you can have multiple farms, multiple site collections, and so on, all using the same workflows on the same um, the same workflow runtime. So that could be that one department is running workflows on the same machines as another department. So there you want to have isolation and security too. So these concepts are built in into Workflow Manager. As I said, the biggest customer was SharePoint. So I think it's pretty um, robust for that. And these concepts make me think about this little hotel I was in. Um, and I see someone laughing. And there's probably other guys who were in the same hotel, the Z Hotel. Um, it's compact. I felt like a little workflow inside Workflow Manager. <laughs> yeah, it was even smaller, yeah. So it was very high density. So the hotel itself, the surface of the hotel is not that big, but I think they were able to fit a lot of rooms in it. Um, I was in my own, you know, isolated cocoon. But of course, I cannot do too much things. I cannot start yelling at 3 o'clock in the night. So I, I still have to behave. I, I have some policies I, I need to be into. So these things made me think about, OK, this is what a workflow should feel like in a workflow manager. So what is it? These things come back. And actually, it's about workflows, and they use service bus. So again, this is just as BizTalk services, another technology that uses service bus behind the scenes. Um, at this point, it's service bus for Windows Server. So you cannot run wor workflow manager against service bus uh, service in the cloud. So that's something that I tried. It's because of the authentication is just Windows based. Of course, this will change um, with the new versions. And then, of course, you have your front end and you have a SQL back end for your uh, resources. Everything you do against those uh, management um, APIs, it's all about REST and HTTP. The problem is that the, um, the REST API is not officially supported. So actually, you can only talk through the client object model but you can use Fiddler and so on, and you can see the uh, REST APIs. Um, coming back here, so you have the workflow and service bus all talking with each other. You can isolate them on different machines. You can put them together. What I tried was um, running these workflows against SQL Azure, and that definitely works. It's just SQL um, or service bus uh, service that doesn't work. So that's an important one. The things that get installed um, and that people like Tord have to mention, uh, to, to manage, sorry, um, it's an IIS, so you have a new website, the management site, and that's where you talk to. Start workflow, get state of workflow, that's all through the APIs there. <coughs> and then you have some services, the real engine, just like we have with Bistalk. So you have them for service bus um, with the gateway and the backend and the workflow service. And all of that is 
with the fabric host service that is actually the on-premise version of the cloud um, runtime that we have for these um, things. In SQL, you see that you have at least um, six databases, so three for workflow and three for service bus. Of course, you can scale, you can have different containers, different namespaces, and so on, so they will create new databases, okay? How do you install it? Just a matter of using the web platform installer, so you select workflow, you download it, um, you can install it on Windows 8, Azure um, Virtual Machines, and of course, Windows Server 2012. Um, and then you have the configuration wizard, and what I like about the wizard, if you, if you do next, 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 finish, it gives you the PowerShell script that you would, that it will execute behind the scenes. So most of the time I copy them because if something fails, at least you can easily start, you know, um, trying the PowerShell script yourself. Um, and again, if you have a single box machine, all goes well. This talk standard installation, you know how it goes. If you need to create a farm, that's where you have to have the security and so on again. So that's where you typically will um, fall back on um, PowerShell. You can use SQL Server Express um, and SQL Azure. Of course, you can have the SQL standard and above. Um, and you have service bus for Windows Server, as I mentioned. So these are the components that are um, part of it. If you install Workflow Manager, service bus gets installed automatically for you. Again, you can um, configure it. <coughs> um, before I jump into this, let me just switch to my virtual machine. As you can see, this machine is running in the cloud, so it's just an uh, Azure machine that I used. So if you want to have the getting started tutorial, this is a sample you will have. So it just gets products, and this is the workflow. So as I said in the beginning, the art, so the biggest uh, the biggest artifact that you use as a developer is the activities. So you create activities and you will use activities. So they are the parts of the components. So here I have an activity that just does an HTTP send against services OData. So you have the Northwind database exposed as an OData service. If you don't know that, this is pretty handy to do some basic tests. You don't have to create your service yourself. So with the, maybe the JSON adapter of BizTalk, this is one that you could easily use for testing. Um, you can even have your own tenant, I believe, to update and so on, so pretty nice. Um, so I just do a get um, on that URI, and I get back a value, a JSON value. That value will then be um, used in my workflow. I'm going back on the details, but this is just the activity that I use, get product. So I can drag and drop from my toolbox here. If I search get products, I can drag and drop these activities. And of course, you have a lot of <coughs> standard activities in the toolbox, like a for each. The typical ones that you know from um, BizTalk Server. So for every um, yeah, orchestration shape, there's um, a matching workflow activity, okay? Um, what do you do? So this is just a workflow. I do a count, I then do a loop. So for every loop, I set the user status, so this is just a public variable that I can um, interpret, I can ask from the outside, nothing special here, and I'm not diving into the details, but this is just a workflow that gets on the OData service all those activities. What do I do then? I have to deploy these workflows, and that's where <coughs> the tooling typically lags, but there are some open source um, CodePlex tools, so again, Oh, this is the configuration manager, sorry. If I open this one, I can connect, and that's where you see I can connect to, a, to my management endpoint. So this is the management endpoint on my local machine. This is the default port 12 to uh, 90. When I connect, I can then see that I have some scopes. At this point, I have three. Let me um, delete this one. So this is the open open source or sample solution that you can use, and I added some, some uh, buttons like this one, F5, wonderful. Um, so I deleted my scope, and what I will do, just from the management code, I will deploy my workflow. And I'm, again, don't want to bother you with all the details, but I create a workflow management client. Um, I then publish my activity, I publish my workflow, and after that, I will start the workflow, and I will pass in 
a keyword. So I will be able to search for um, activities or for products on the Northwind database with uh, that match the filter that I will give from the outside. So I'm passing an external keyword to that um, workflow, and then I will be pulling the user status. So every time the user status changes, I will be writing it. How can I pass that to the workflow? So in the arguments, I can pass in my search keyword. So I have input arguments, output arguments. So all these things are, allow you to change and to talk with um, workflows. <coughs> So let's just deploy this one. And this is one of the few console applications you will see. I have some UI coming up, wonderful. So I'm setting up my scope, deploying my activity, and I will be querying all the products with AA. And I'm a, I see there's two products, and the products are being written here. Um, and then I fall back to my, um, my workflow explorer, the sample. And I'm able to drill down and see the persistent workflows. So this is one workflow, and it has one instance. And you can see it just was created like 18 seconds ago. And you can see there's variables. At this point, only one variable, the user status. So I can set that user status, and I can query that. So that's basic concepts. You can deploy to your HTTP endpoints, your workflows itself, or basic um, workflows of .NET. Um, and you can just use the management. What you then have with testing and debugging, and this is not the nicest, nicest and cleanest solution, you can deploy your workflows to a test service host. So you just start this console application that has a different port, and you deploy there. And then you can attach from Visual Studio to that different process, and you can step through in your workflow. Not the cleanest solution, and I hope that will definitely change um, with the future. So the scopes, I talked about that. You have scopes and it's a hierarchy. So you can put different security levels. I can say, okay, the HRM scope can only be accessed by clients that have this sec um, security token and things like that. So it's all about security and isolation. And then you have the concept of the sandboxing. So <coughs> if this will run in the cloud, I don't want to be, um, bothered by my neighbor on the same machine if it's a high density solution because he's doing you know something crazy loading an xml file of 100 megabytes and so on so these things have to be prevented and they do that through the trusted surface so the trusted surface is a concept where you can only deploy um, activities and only use data types that are being allowed by the administrator of the workflow um, <laughs> manager. So by default, I'll get back to the list. Um, you only have a very limited set, um, but you can allow some custom components. For example, if you have your own service, you can just create your custom components that you say, okay, if you want to talk to service bus, here is my tested and verified components. This is the one that I will whitelist. If you say, I'm just the only one using my workflow manager, then you can use um, that PowerShell script to just disable sandboxing, and then you can deploy everything. So the thing that John showed yesterday had a lot of custom code, custom code activities. That would not be able to run on the default workflow manager yet, except if you disable the whitelisting. So that's something important to, um, to understand. So things that are um, supported, you can see them. I will not walk through all of them. But for example, a long in N64, you don't find it there. So you just have to um, be able to live with that or whitelist those specific um, components. And then what you also have is a concept of complex data structures. So we all know we are BizTalk guys. What you do with BizTalk, you get data and it's transformed or serialized into XML. And we work on the XML. And if the XML adds an element, no one cares. BizTalk doesn't look at it except if you do the validation or the parsing. Um, it's just an XML document. This is different here. Um, and they don't support XML. They support JSON. So BizTalk Services doesn't support JSON, but supports XML. So there's some work to do there. Um, and the way they support JSON, that's through dynamic values. So what I did here on my demo, I did a get products um, against 
uh, the OData service, I get back a JSON structure. That JSON structure, I can walk through, I can read through, but I have to do that using these dynamic values. <laughs> I don't want to go too, too much in the details, but you can have um, pods to query for specific data. So you could say, if I want to have the first name of my customer, I will use customer first name and I will get back the value. <coughs> Pretty difficult to understand, so therefore I have a base example uh, with a dynamic value evaluator. Again, this is a tool that's um, coming with the samples. So what I have, I added here uh, stack overflow, you might know that. So I'm getting all the um, entity sets they have on Stack Overflow. So this is just the API. So what I, for example, could do, I can then say, okay, maybe I want to get the first or the second entity set that was returned in this dynamic value. And then I have to do something. It's not XPOT. It's not JSON pod. It's, yeah, it's pod. So the dynamic value pod. So what I'll do is I'll do D um, and then probably entity sets. I can see I get back the collection of that specific element, and maybe I want to get the second value, and then I, no, no square brackets, it's um, standard brackets, it would be too um, familiar with um, XML, uh, XPOT. So this is the way you can do queries against these dynamic values. Um, and you can do that, for example here, get product name, is a dynamic value, get dynamic value against my return JSON. And what I will get, I get the X. So I'm looping, so items is like an integer. I'm getting the first or second or third element. And from that, I get the product name. So this is not strong typed. So if you compile things in BizTalk and something, you know, you enter a value or a variable incorrectly, you get all these exclamation marks. This will happily pass if I do product name two, and you will only find it out in your tests. So very important to um, get this one. So I wonder how they will um, you know, do that in the next um, workflow um, service. Again, I'm not 100% sure they will go for a high density solution so that not everyone has his own machines. If you look at um, BizTalk services as, at this point in time, you can see that if you deploy a BizTalk service, you get your own set of machines. Um, initially, they were thinking to have BizTalk services as a shared environment, so they would have their hundreds of machines, and you would deploy on one of those machines, much like Service Bus, but because of the requirements of custom code, eh, everyone wanted to have custom code, custom pipeline components, and so on, they were not able to do that. So that's something, an engineering problem that Microsoft has internally at this point in time, and with IIS, they solve it for the websites, but to have on the same machine, some kind of containers and isolation. That's something that um, would solve a lot of things in, in, in their cloud platform, in my opinion. But this is my opinion then. Um, falling back on the external communication, because that's what you do. You have a workflow. And of course, if it's a single workflow, it executes and it finishes. But if you have long running workflows, you want to send new messages, new events. You want to correlate and all of that. So you can do two things. <laughs> First of all, you have the HTTP activities. So you can send notifications to a um, workflow using the REST API, which is not supported, or you use the um, workflow client. So this is just the object, client object that I showed, so you can say start new activity with these parameters and so on. You have support for the security tokens and so on. And you can also consume um, all the HTTP services. So I consume the OData service, um, I do all of these things. So that's using the HTTP activities. Then you have PubSub, and this is where it gets in interesting, especially for us um, integration guys and girls. Um, we can use service bus, and you can use long-running correlation. So you can have building a filter, you can subscribe on events, and then you have um, two things. If you do a subscribe, it creates on the service bus topic a subscription not going into details, you will see it later on. And if a message enters, I publish a notification, that message will be published to the topic of my scope, and it will end up and trigger the event in my workflow. I also have a receive, and that subscription would, would keep on existing. So you would use that for 
looping for like sequential convoys. Everything of the same order has to be arriving in the same instance of the workflow. <coughs> you also have another thing which is called the receive notification. And there you can just listen um, for an event. And as soon as you get the event, the subscription like deletes itself on the, um, on the topic. So that's like a one-time subscription. So if you use a filter, it's temporarily. If you use a subscription handle, it exists. It keeps on existing. So my first demo, I have a fancy order app. You will be impressed after all these, you know, except for Kent. Kent was good in, in the UI. But um, I have my own um, client application. And it will talk directly against Workflow Manager using the HTTP um, client. And then I have BizTalk services. And there I want to create um, updates to my SQL. I want to send EDI, all these things. And then, of course, I had the issue that Workflow Manager is speaking JSON. BizTalk services is speaking XML. <laughs> um, so BizTalk services, XML. Um, the other one, JSON. So for that, and that's probably something you have to do if you want to run in the trusted um, surface, I created my own API, web API, and I was able to speak REST from my workflow manager using these HTTP activities. And then the complex objects that I got were serialized to XML and passed on to the um, Pistock services. I used um, service bus subscriptions and topics uh, because that was the brand newest thing with the new, uh, latest release. So I wanted to get that in the demo. And all the events like create order, complete order, it's a purchase order demo, by the way, of course. Um, it's a best demo. So all the events are sent to my local on-prem SQL server. And if the order is completed, I also create an edit fact, the other new feature that came, um, an edit fact message onto uh, an FTP server. So that's the end-to-end -end demo. Let me show you um, how it worked. So this is my workflow, and this is a flowchart workflow. So you have more flexibility of dragging and dropping things around. Um, and these are all the activities. So first of all, I get an argument from the outside, and it's a dynamic value. So dynamic value, again, this is the JSON structure that I pass on from my API to here. This could be whatever. But I know, I just trust my API that it will be um, an order. Then I have this um, parse order activity. Um, and that should be here. Nino, do you already have such a tool for a workflow manager? <laughs> like find your solution? <laughs> <laughs> so it's here. And I pass on the thing. And then I get these values. So I get the order number. And how do I get it? I pass on the path variable. So this is the thing that I mentioned. I get header slash order number. And this will be stored in my outgoing argument, order number, and so on. So I do that for all these um, values. Then I go on and I, oops, I create the order. And if I drill down to the create order activity, you will see that I'm doing a HTTP post. And I'm doing that towards this URI. <coughs> so hard-coded URI in your activities, that's not what you want to do in an end solution, but this is just a demo. So I'm just calling my local web API and passing on that um, activity. So I'm doing a post to that thing. And then my API is putting it on service bus um, topic. So if I click here and I connect with service bus explorer to my workflow manager. And that takes a while. So there I have my order events topic with different subscriptions. And you can see the filter. Um, here, so you can see if the order type is cancel order, and if for the completion I have one for every different uh, event type. So I just put messages on the subscription for my workflow. It's done. The handling of those messages will be done by my web's 
my Bistalk um, bridge. Okay? So the Bistalk bridge is just here. Let me close this instance of Visual Studio. I don't need you anymore. And there we have the bridge, which has three different endpoints or source endpoints. All of them are linked with an activity, uh, within a subscription. So here I have the create subscription. I do a mapping towards, uh, a mapping and so on, from my um, incoming serialized order to my local um, SQL database structure. So there I have a store procedure, order create, and I have these um, parameters that I, I'll be sending on, okay? So that's what I'm doing for all these things. And of course, behind the scenes, um, and we saw that earlier um, today, I have my adapter service. And this is not a WAPS um, demo, so that's why I'm not going in too much in the details. But there I have my Bistalk service um, exposing the endpoint for my SQL um, adapter. So let's go to my client application. And it's even not in WPF, it's old school Windows Forms. So, yeah, cool, huh? Summit 008 for customer. And let's add a few lines. And I'm creating the order. So first of all, because you have to believe me, the database is empty. So I'm now creating the order. Um, and my workflow, if we go and have a look at the workflow manager, you should be able to see that in my order demo, I have one instance started 13 seconds ago. And I can see that I'm subscribing now for all new events on Summit 008. So that's something that I have written myself um, in the user status. So this, this is feedback that I can give back. So I'm now listening for new events. And let me create a new order. And then I will be doing a cancel of my first one. And the status was new. So if I do an F5 or execute, it's canceled. And what I'll be doing now, if I complete, I'm expecting to have an EDI order in this folder. So if I do an F5, you can see it's empty. So I'll be completing my um, summit 007 demo, um, doing complete here. You can see there it's completed, but that's all client side. Um, and there we have F5, so we have an EDI message on my FTP server, managed or orchestrated through Workflow Manager, but the actual logic, the mapping and all of that was all done by Bistock services. So if I just want to view the mapping here, you can see I'm not good at UIs, as you've seen. So what I always prefer to do is using other things that are, I like giving nice demos, um, but I don't like nice UIs. So last, last uh, spring, I think I gave a demo where my curtains at home went up and I could show that through an IP camera. So all those geeky things, I like that. <laughs> what I do here, um, I use Twilio. Who knows Twilio? Okay, not that much of people. Um, like four or something. So Twilio allows you to do um, voice, like calling, um, sending text messages and all through the cloud. And this is a wonderful thing to play with because it's very easy and it has a nice web API. So you can have REST calls and so on against it. So let me first go to my Twilio account and I still have $11 left. So let's hope we make it by the end of the demo. Um, what you can do, you can create and acquire numbers. So I have three numbers, a toll free even in the UK. And I say, if someone calls to this number, just go to this API. Don't do it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a, well, don't mind. I could um, leave out all the numbers. Um, and as you could see, I have this, where's my numbers? I have a demo prepared, um, this one. 
So if I will be calling this number, the 4, 4, and so on, let me start zooming here. So if I'll be calling this number, um, I'll be, or Twilio, sorry, will be um, directing to this API here. And this is very basic. So what you need to do on that endpoint that you can host yourself, you can create or you can return something that they call Twimmel. So it's Twilio XML or Twilio markup language. Um, but it's very easy to understand if you see this. For example, this is a basic one. If I would be returning on my API this one, you would hear a woman say, please leave a message after the tone. And that message would be recorded. And it could only take 20 seconds, things like that. You can do a gather, and that's what I'll be using in my demo. So you can collect what's, you know, what digits did the caller enter, like press one for this, press two for that. I actually have this one. So I should have Alice saying in English, British English, that this is going to be cool. So I'm using Skype to call to that number. Where's the sound? And then my demo would be not so interesting, of course. <laughs> Actually, I checked it just before the, do you have no, any ID? <laughs> I wanted to say another word. But <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll use this speaker, being creative. Yeah. <laughs> this demo is going to be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. What I want to do, I want to use a state machine. So a state machine is a concept where you have different states. And let me show the, the, the concept first. So Twilio API is calling my custom API. So they are calling the one that I created. And I will be able to create a menu for a flight. So you will be able to call to the flight automated system. They will detect based on your incoming phone number if there's a flight linked for you. If you have a flight, you will get some options like, do you want to check in, do you want to upgrade, and so on. Press one to do that, and so on. That logic is all in my workflow. So that's the model where I have my workflow <coughs> defined. That's a state machine. And then I'll um, continue. So if we now go to the actual state machine and the resolution is not that big so I'll zoom out a little bit yeah, difficult to see but what you can see my initial state is this one because the start goes here and then the initial state does the first action the entry is just set user status and then I get the user flight. So I have the caller ID from Twilio. He gives that as parameters, caller, the digits, and so on. I get that. Um, I retrieve the flights. This is just hard-coded here in the demo, but I could now do a call to a database or a web service. If a flight is found, I go automatically to the next um, state. There I have, um, from that state, I set some options. So this is just setting an external variable and so it's like a, a dictionary of options you will be able to see that normally here so the values press 1 to check in press 2 to upgrade press 3 to cancel so that's the first thing that you will be able to hear normally I'm setting that variable and then I have different transitions and this is where service bus comes into place so I have a transition if you have pressed 1, if you have pressed 2, or if you have pressed 3. So if you pressed 1, I go to the state check-in. Um, otherwise, I go to the state upgrade, and otherwise, I go to cancel. So based on um, service bus. And how do I do that? 
I created this custom activity that just uses these pub sub activities. So receive caller input. So I build a filter that says if an event arrives for that specific caller, so I know this is the workflow instance for caller of Tom and this is the one for Glenn and so on. So there will be multiple instances for every caller. And the received digit matches the one for this um, event. Then I will subscribe and I will um, be raised. So what happens if I click here? If someone presses 9, this transition will happen and I will go to the next state, which is the exit, and so on. So that's the way of having your transition go. So I will be giving input from Twilio because the digits will be given as input to my workflow instances. And based on that, things will um, continue and evolve. My API itself, I'll, I'll probably share the code afterwards, but that API is just investigating or asking the workflow manager what's the status, what's the next options for that specific instance. So caller A, what's the next options? And then I'm returning that in my Twilio response. So let's give it a try. So now he's calling my API. Do you hear this? Even a sound. So that's the play verb. Please select one of the following options. Press 1 to check in. Press 2 to upgrade your flight. Press 3 to cancel your flight. Press star to confirm. So now I can press 1, star. And then my workflow continues to the next state, and I get back options. this one. Press 1 if you want to check in luggage. Press 2 if you don't need to check in luggage. Press I don't. start to confirm. No luggage for me. You can go straight to the gate. Thank you and goodbye. So this is all done automatically by Twilio. <laughs> and Actually, the magic here is not Workflow Manager. This is Twilio. That's the awesome thing. So what I'll, doing, what I'll be doing, I'll be um, all these events from Workflow Manager are published on the Workflow Manager topic. Also tracking events. So I create a subscription myself on that topic for all the tracked events. I will show that. So these will be <coughs> written automatically just by service bus to this subscription. And then I have another console app that listens on that subscription, but that sends all these events that come in to my front end using SignalR. So that's the next step in the demo. And let me show you how it works under the covers. There again I have um, this one, but I'll be now connecting to the local workflow manager. So. Yes, there it is. And there you can see that I have a topic. So a service bus topic for every single topic, uh, every single scope I have in my um, workflow manager. So the one phone state demo, remember, has a topic. And it has a lot of subscriptions behind the scenes, uh, a lot of rules for this. So this is the subscription you don't want to mess with. This is the system one you don't touch. But what I did, I just created a new one with a specific rule that says if the action name, and that's the system property they add to all these messages, if the action name equals tracking, then all these messages will end up in this specific tracking subscription. Okay? So to find out this action, I just created a subscription that had one equals one, and then I had all the events, and I just picked out, picked out the one that I wanted, and that's um, this one. So these are the events. Um, and the next thing was, I then have my console application, just using service bus, don't want to bother you with um, those details. And normally there will be some events still on that tracking topic from my previous calls. So it will listen and it will now publish them all through SignalR. So you can see all these settings here. So if I do a new call now, you will see automatically the things appear. 
And I would advise you now, because this is where the contest starts, in one of these, one of these activities, there is logic that inserts your phone number into a local database. So the first phone number, and it's with uh, index in SQL, the first phone number that ends up gets a gift from Saravana. Sorry, it has to be you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's toll free. I tried it from Belgium phone number. It, my provider doesn't allow, so it will probably not work for all of you. If you press this number, like one, you have to do one star and so on. <laughs> And I can see already that there's people calling. So who will be the first and who will be the one that ends up in the right <laughs> database? <clears throat> I wasn't expecting that amount of success. And I haven't tried it, so I just hope this scales. <laughs> Someone is completed. That's not good. That's not you. Let me go in my... Database table, <coughs> the table is called winners. No one yet. I can give a hint. You have to press two in the beginning. So let's do a refresh to see if there's new calls coming in or something. So, but this is just using SignalR behind the scenes to publish things. Then I'm using XML. Ah, seems we have a guy here. You found the secret spot. So let's go. <laughs> let's go and have a look in the table. And the first one is, I think it's an American. Tom, congratulations. <laughs> I hope my credit is, you know, Keeping up, let's do an F5. I had 11.09, so there's one and a half euro because it's a toll-free number and that costs me more than it does you. But I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to have people here. Uh, so, congratulations, Tom. Um, and with that, I would end. So, what I say is that looking in the um, in the features of um, workflow manager, looking at the architecture of Workflow Manager, and maybe forgetting a little bit about the details that are sometimes not that um, nice, like the debugging, like the dynamic value, and so on. If we just set that besides, I think that we will see a lot of these concepts coming up in the, um, the new workflow services that are being announced. Um, one of the things that is also announced, and I want to reiterate for those who have missed that, there will be BPMN support, so that's an important one, especially if you want to check those boxes on RFPs. Um, so I'm looking out for that. I know that there's private um, TAP programs. Um, I think you should contact Guru or Harish for that if you're having a good scenario for it. Um, and with that, I would like to thank um, Saravana for having me and you for you know, being so persistent and uh, stay here. Thank you.